Amen. Hey, we're back in the book of John. Took a little break last week, and we looked at that one verse about being more like Christ. Uh, back in John, John chapter 5, verse 18 is where we left off. And uh, we're going to go verse by verse to the end of the chapter today. And we're going to look at the greatness, the greatness of Jesus Christ this morning. You know, it's, it's amazing. As we go through the Gospel of John, we're going to see over and over again the greatness of Jesus. Because John was in his 90s when he wrote this book. He was uh, uh, the elder ap apostle. All the other apostles were gone. They'd been martyred. And I could just see him writing the book of the Gospel of John and saying, man, I had the chance for three years to, to roam the earth and do public ministry with God in the flesh. And that's why he wrote in John chapter 1, in the, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And, we, and he we dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so today, we're going we're gonna to see from the lips of Jesus himself some things that point to his glory, some things that point to his greatness. We're going to see three things he points to that makes him great. And then we're going to see at the end of the chapter, we're going to see four things that testify to his greatness, four different avenues that God used to point to the greatness of Jesus Christ. Good message this morning for us going into the Thanksgiving holiday, remembering how great our God is, right? I think oftentimes we just take it for granted, man. We just take for granted the blessings that God blesses us. We take for granted the greatness of the God that we're connected to. I don't want to take that for granted. I want to remind you this morning from the Word how great our God is. Uh, how great our God is. Amen? And so turn to John chapter 5. And we're going to talk about the greatness of Jesus Christ as we go through this, the rest of this chapter. And again, we ended up in John chapter 5, verse 18, when we were, we, uh, were last in the book of John. Now, before we get into it, history itself bears witness to the greatness of Jesus Christ. Do you know all of history is his story? It really is. Even history's dividing point goes back to the birth of Jesus Christ. What does B.C. stand for? Before Christ. What does A.D. stand for? That's, uh, some people said after death. No, it doesn't. It, says, it stands for Addo Domini which literally means, in the Latin, it means the year of his birth. And so the very dividing point of history itself is the year of Jesus' birth. When God came to this earth and dwelt among us, and he brought his glory with him. And so the birth of Jesus Christ is the dividing point of history itself. That points, to, again, to his greatness. And when you think about it, think about the impact that Jesus Christ had in three short years of public ministry. I know I don't look that old, but I've been in the ministry 30 years. 30 years, three decades. And I've, we've seen some great things. We've seen three churches planted in San Diego and Wisconsin, now here in South Carolina. God has done some great things the last 30 years of ministry. It's all to his glory, but it's nothing compared to what Jesus did in three years. Jesus changed the world. He's still changing the world. 2,000 plus years later because of his greatness displayed through his just three short years of public ministry. The older I get, the faster time goes, and I know how small three years is. Jesus changed the world in three years. A great, great poem to this, and I'm going to have actually a video of this poem read at our Christmas Eve service by Michael W. Smith, but I'll read it this morning. You'll get Michael W. Smith on Christmas Eve, okay? He was born in an obscure village, the son of a peasant woman, he grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he became a wandering preacher. He never wrote a book, never held an office, never had a family or owned a house. He didn't even go to college, never visited a big city, never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of those things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but just himself. He was 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends, friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies, went through a mockery of a trial, was executed by the state. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth, his clothing. When he was dead, he was laid in a bowered grave through the pity of a friend. But I love this. 20 centuries have come and gone, and today this man 
is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as Jesus' one solitary life. Can we say amen to that? Let's look at why Jesus is so great from his own words. Back to chapter 5, verse 18. It says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Now, context. What did Jesus just do? John will do this as we go through the Gospel of John. He'll show a miracle of Jesus, and that'll go right into the teaching of Jesus after that. The miracle of Jesus was he was at the pool of Bethsaida by Jerusalem, and he saw this lame man who had been lame for 38 years, hadn't walked in 38 years. And Jesus, the one that said, let there be light, and the lights were turned on, turned on in our creation, said to this man, get up, arise, take up your pallet, and walk. This man, yes, sir. <laughs> he got up, and he began walking for the first time in 38 years. And he started taking his pallet, as Jesus told him, and walked. But the problem was with the religious leaders, it was the Shabbat. It was the Sabbath. And part of the rabbinical tradition was you don't carry anything on the Sabbath. And here's this man walking around Jerusalem with his, it was, in their view, he was working. And so they said, who is this? Who, who told you you could, you could carry this pal? You're working right now. You're breaking the Shabbat. And I could just see this guy in that situation just saying, are you kidding me? I haven't walked in 38 years, and you're, you're giving me a hard time about carrying a little pallet right here? If it was me, that's what I'd be thinking. And the guy says, I don't know who told me to. He just disappeared after he told me to get up and walk, and I'm walking now. And so then the man just leaves the religious leaders. He goes from the religious leaders. He goes to the temple, appropriate place. Where do you go after God just did a miracle of healing you and bringing you to a place of being able to walk again in 38 years? You go to a temple to worship God. He goes to the temple, and he runs into Jesus at the temple. And Jesus says, hey, go and sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. You know, and then, then the religious leaders realize it was Jesus who healed them. And then they come to Jesus, who do you think you are telling this man to, to do work on the Sabbath? And remember what Jesus said last, last section we looked at? He said, hey, hey, listen, my father doesn't stop working even on the Shabbat, and I don't stop working either. My, the, the Psalms tell us that God never slumbers or sleeps. He's always at work in the world, whether it's Sunday, Saturday, or Friday, or Monday. He's always working. And Jesus says, and I'm going to go with my Father's work. And if he tells me to heal someone on the Shabbat, I'm going to heal someone on the Shabbat. And then, this is interesting, and then it says the enemies, the verse we just read, verse 18, the enemies realized that Jesus, in declaring that he could work even on the Shabbat, was declaring himself what? Equal with God. That's the first thing that makes Jesus great. His Jesus was very clear on this point. All throughout the Gospels, all throughout his teaching, he's God. He said, I and the Father are one. He said to Philip, Philip said, just show us God, and it'll be enough. Just show us the Father, it'll be enough. And he said, hey, Philip, in seeing me, you're seeing the Father. You're seeing God. That's quite a statement right there, by the way. And all throughout the scriptures, it's very clear, very clear. Jesus makes it very clear through his word. He is God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Wonderful Counselor. Isaiah 9, 6 says, He is mighty God. God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. Again, the Word was with God, and the Word, Jesus Christ, was and is God. Can it get any clearer than that? So the next time those guys with the white shirts and the black ties come to your door, ask them, do you believe Jesus Christ is God? Oh, no, he's a son of God like we're sons of God. He's a divine messenger, a great prophet. He, he's a savior. He died on a cross. But no, if they're honest with you, they'll say, no, 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 he ain't God. And then you're going to have to say, well, that's not what my Bible says. Because the chief characteristic of every false teaching group out there, every cult, is they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. In church, we need to stick with that. Amen? Amen. We need to stick with what Jesus said about himself. He is mighty God. He is, he is, he is God in the flesh. And that's what makes him so great. And he proved that he was God in the flesh by even predicting his own resurrection. 
He said, and if you tear down this temple, talking about his body, in three days, I will raise it up. And he proved his deity by raising himself up after three days. After dying on Friday, he was, man, he was alive on Sunday with his pierced hands, sword pierced side, and he went right to his disciples, showed them, even doubting Thomas. He said, give me your finger, put it in a nail pierced hand. Give me your hand, put it in the sword sword pierced side after, after he was dead. And then what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, oh, nope, didn't get that right, Thomas. No, he said he accepted it. And he said, Thomas, you're blessed because you've seen and you believe. Blessed are those who don't see and yet they believe. They believe what? They believe that Jesus is God, that he's Savior, he's Lord, and he's great in that way. So don't ever, don't ever, don't ever deny the deity of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him, and he is God in the flesh. That's what makes him so great. Amen? And that's, even the enemies were getting this. He said, this guy, this Jesus, in breaking the Sabbath, verse 18, was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now go on, verse 19. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it was something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Now, here's the second thing that makes Jesus great. He's not only declaring he's equal with God. He's not only declaring that he is God in the flesh. But what makes him great also is he's working in tandem with the Heavenly Father to do God's will here on earth. Look at those verses again. Go back to verse uh, 19. He says, whatever he sees the Father doing, whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. That's what made, made him so great. He was constantly in sync with the Father, doing the Father's will, even with the cross. Remember Garden of Gethsemane? He said, let this cup pass from me. In his human flesh, he said, I don't want to go through this, Lord. Let this cup pass from me. But Father, not my will be done. But what? Your will be done. That's what made him so great. He was constantly seeking the Father's will. By the way, that's why he was constantly disappearing in prayer, too. You know, the disciples, where's Jesus? Oh, he's on the mountain praying again. Where's Jesus? It's dark and it, 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 the sun hasn't even risen yet. Where's Jesus? He's, on, he's praying. He's seeking the Father's will and then doing the Father's will in tandem with the Father. Even the, before he picked the apostles. Do you know the Gospel of Luke says that he spent a whole night praying to the Father because he wanted to be in sync with the Father's will before choosing those apostles that were going to lead his church and write his scripture. Amazing. And so there's a principle here for us too, by the way, as disciples of Christ. You want to, you want to have a life that's blessed? You want to have a life that counts for God, that's going to be doing things in this world for God that makes a difference? Then seek the Father's will and do the Father's will. Be a person of prayer that doesn't just do your own thing and then ask God to bless it. You know, that doesn't work very often, very good. I'm just going to make my own decisions, do my own thing, and then God, will you please bless it? No, no, no. What does God want us to do? He wants us to seek his will, have an attitude that says, whatever you direct me to do, Lord, I'll do, and then God will bless it. Great book, by the way, if you want to read this on this same topic, uh, Henry Blackaby, Experiencing God. The whole thesis of the book is in just, the whole thesis is don't make your own decisions, go your own directions, and then pray after you're done for God to bless. Rather, the thesis of the book is this. You seek God's will, and you seek his direction, and you go his way, and what you do will be blessed. Does that make sense? It drives right with Scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your what? Pass straight, or he will direct your paths. And it's all a matter of, of getting in sync. And what Jesus was constantly doing, what made him so great, was he was constantly getting in sync with the direction of the Father and then saying, Not my will be done, Father, but your will be done. And then was, God was constantly blessing his directions and what he was doing. And he'll do that for us too. And I've, I've lived now 54 years. And I realize, looking back on my spiritual pilgrimage, I've made a lot of decisions sometimes and just in my flesh. And then I ask God, oh, God, rescue me from this. Help me, you know. And I've learned it's a lot smarter, especially with major decisions. 
to go the direction of just seeking the Father's heart and then doing what he t- says to do and say, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm going to go do your will, not my will. And you know what? I've learned, I've learned to appreciate God's will. Because when I see I'm in sync with his will, things just go right. Things go blessed. You know, it's, it's interesting. I went to, um, I went to uh, the Clemson game yesterday. Yo, go Tigers. Number one in the nation right now. And some of you Gamecocks are saying, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but... I just, another evidence of being blessed uh, yesterday, I was up, went up there primarily to connect with my uh, 20-year-old who's a sophomore at Clemson now. I haven't been up enough because of health issues and so I haven't been up to see him enough. So Heidi and I hightailed it up there. We we're just going to go for the first half and uh, we were going to uh, uh, hang out with him before the game uh, and then, then uh, see, see our, our second son, David, af- at halftime too. We got to do both. It was great. And so I don't have tickets, so I'm walking around the stadium and just doing this. And it wasn't a peace sign. It was, uh, I need two tickets. Okay? And I'm walking like this, and this guy comes up to me, and he goes, young, probably in his upper 30s or something like that, his little kids with him and stuff, and he goes, do you need two tickets? And I said, yeah, that's why I'm going like this. And, and he goes, well, I got two tickets, lower deck. And he, he goes, uh, um, and I go, well, how much do you want for him and stuff? He had extra tickets, season tickets or something like that. And he goes, uh, Free. Free. I'm going, excuse me? Say what? He said, free. I just want to give him, I just want you guys to sit with us because we have a whole group and we have two extra seats. We'd like, like you guys to sit with us. I'm going, are you kidding me? And then, and, then we, <laughs> and then we get in the stadium and I'm following Heidi to where the usher says to go to the seats and we keep descending and we keep descending and we keep descending. We were on the third row right behind Wake Forest. We could hear the coaches giving directions to the players. I'm going, thank you, Lord. And this was free. <laughs> and I'm Dutch. It was awesome. But I was thinking as I was sitting there and, and hearing the play, the coaches talking to the players and everything else like that, I was sitting there, God, God, you're so good. Even the little things like that, that's not that big a deal going to a football game. But when you see God's hand just blessing and our main reason for going up there wasn't to watch a football game. It was to be with our, our sons and to have a connection with our family and stuff. But God said, I'm going to bless you even besides seeing your sons. I'm going to bless you with some free tickets where you can just hang out and have a great time with your best friend, Heidi. And I was thinking, that's, God is so good. God is so good. Amen? Amen? Even in the little things, we see God's goodness. But again, it, it involves getting in the will getting in the flow, and as you're in the flow of God's will, you trust in him, not letting your understand, looking to him, acknowledging him, and going his direction, he'll make your path straight, and he will bless, and that's the life of Jesus. That's all Jesus did. Jesus was great because all he did was get in sync with the Father and to do the Father's will. Amen? And then he goes on, verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Here's the third reason that makes Jesus so great from his teaching. Third thing that makes Jesus so great is this is that he's the source, he's the source of life, and specifically, the source of eternal life. And it's interesting, he's saying here, just as the Father, God, raises the dead, gives them life, even so the Son gives to life whomever he wishes. So if you want life, who do you go to for life? Jesus. And he can raise you from the dead dead. Spiritually, he can raise you from the dead. Physically, he can raise you from the dead. And he's going to prove his words here. Just three months from this very teaching in his public ministry, he comes upon this funeral service. And this funeral service is right outside outside the city of Nain. And it's a widow. She'd already lost her husband. Now she lost her son. And Jesus, in his compassion, looks upon this widow who's just probably bawling her eyes out. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to pull the divine card here. I have the power to raise life. And he healed the widow's son. I want to see that videotape when I get to heaven. Can you imagine? 
the widow, mourning the loss of her son, funeral procession, Jesus comes up. You're healed. And he raises the son to life. Another proof of his deity, amen? And then three months later in his public ministry, just three months after that, he goes to Jairus' house. Another parent lost, lost his daughter. You know, kids aren't supposed to die before their parents. Brokenhearted. And this Jairus, and even the mourners, professional mourners outside the room say, hey, don't bother the teacher. The girl's died. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. We're going to go on in, we're gonna go on in this situation. We're going we're gonna to do something here. He brings in Peter, James, and John with him into the room. He says, little girl, arise. And you know what she does? She arises. Go, oh, man, that must have been awesome, huh? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the dad in that situation raised his daughter to life? And then a little while later in his public ministry, he comes back to Bethany to two of his best friends, Mary and Martha. You know the Mary and Martha story, the one that Martha gets always a little bad press about working so much and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, right? And he comes to Mary and Martha's Bethany way too late because their brother Lazarus had what? Died. And so Jesus weeps. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. After mourning with them, he goes, okay, let's go. I got the power. I'm God in the flesh. I got the power to raise life. I'm the source of eternal life. And he goes to that tomb and, and he says, move the stone. Get, get, the, get, get the stone. And I love the King James Version. Uh, they say, no, no, no. Don't you understand he's been dead for four days and he stinketh? <laughs> Jesus, I don't care if he stinks. Open the thing up. And then he goes, Lazarus, come forth. And this mummy comes out and it's Lazarus wrapped up in his grave clothes. Can you imagine? That's the power of Jesus. That's what makes him so great. He has the power over life and death. And that's why it says back in the last verse we just read, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but is passed out of death into life. Now that verse is interesting because there are a couple things I want to point to here. First of all, it says this, you present tense in the Greek, if you believe in Jesus Christ, hear his word and believe in Jesus Christ to be your Savior, be your Lord, present tense, right now you have eternal life. You know what that means? You have a slice of heaven, eternal life here on earth through your relationship with Jesus. When you have a relationship with Jesus through prayer, through his word, through worshiping him, you're tasting of eternal life right now. You have eternal life right now. You have heaven on earth through that relationship with Jesus Christ. But notice also it says you passed out of death into what? Into life. The word passed out, translated in the Greek, permanently passed out out of death to life. That's our testimony, gang, if you're a Christian. It's a done deal. It's over. You're not in darkness anymore. You're in the light. You don't have to face eternal judgment and death. You face eternal life. You passed out of death permanently into life. Wonderful, isn't it? If there's not anything else in life to be thankful for, you should be thanking God forever, forever grateful that you passed out of death into life. Romaine, the associate pastor for Pastor Chuck for decades. He's with the Lord now as is Pastor Chuck, founder of Calvary Chapel. But his testimony, after all these hippies giving you know, extended testimonies and everything else and everything else, when he'd give his testimony, he, would, he was very short in his testimony. He said, this is, this is my testimony. He said, I was a jerk. I accepted Christ as my Savior and Lord. I'm going to heaven instead of hell now. Everything else is details. Isn't that great? That's what it's all about, gang. You've passed out of death permanently into life, and right now, right now, you have eternal life because Jesus is the source of eternal life. But notice, notice, he is the only source because Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Amen? And we got to stick to that because we're, we're going against the, the current of political correctness of universalism in our culture. Our culture says, along with Oprah and everybody else, everybody's fine. You're okay, I'm okay, and we're all going to heaven. 
God's love will win over everybody, no matter whether they repent or believe or not. We're all fine. You're okay, I'm okay, and we're all going to heaven. That's universalism. The Bible says uh, different. The Bible says very clearly, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says very clearly, there's only one name under heaven, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there's only one name under heaven by which man must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says very clearly in Timothy, Paul writing to the young pastor, 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, but there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. You know what that's saying? There's only one way. It's only one way. And the source of life and what makes Jesus so great is he is the source of eternal life. And you need to hear his word, believe in him, and then you'll pass out of death to life, but he is the door. He said, I'm the door. And the only door to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what makes him so great. Interesting. Interesting. And it says in verse 23 also, all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not, does not honor the Father who sent him. Do you see what that's saying? You can't bypass the Son. You can't say, well, I'll, I'll believe in Muhammad, I'll believe in whatever God, it doesn't matter. It just, I'm not going to go through Jesus. Well, you're not going to go then. <laughs> because Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. He's the door, and there's no other doors. And that's what makes him so great. And we have to honor the Son if we want a relationship and access to the Father. It's all throughout Scripture. No, 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 no if ands, and buts about that, please. And in our politically correct, universalistic society, we need to stick to that message as Christians. Amen? Amen. That's our message. There's no other way. The way is Jesus. The way is Jesus. And we need to be pointing people to Jesus and sticking with that gospel because there's no other gospel also. Interesting. Um, I'm seeing even churches in our culture today give in to the political correctness that there's other ways. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all going to heaven, love wins. I think we should, <laughs> I think we should write another book. I'm not okay, you're not okay, and that's why we need Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need to honor the Son. Interesting to me, too, when someone hits their thumb with a hammer at work and they're not a believer, what do they use as a curse word oftentimes? The name of Jesus. That's dishonoring the son. I'm sorry. And we can't expect non-believers to act by believers, like believers. We can't, ex we can't judge them and give them a hard time about that. But we can let them know that we're offended by using our Savior's name as a curse word. You know? Good cue on that, by the way. I've done this before, too. Someone uses my Savior's name as a curse word. As soon as they say, Jesus Christ, like that, I'll say, hey, he's coming again. <laughs> he's coming again. And they'll look at me like I'm crazy. But he's coming again. And I'll remind them to have a little reverence with that name, the name that is above all names. Amen? Okay, let's go on now. Truly, truly, Jesus says, again, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil, the evil, it says, to a resurrection of judgment. I could do nothing on my own initiative as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. Now, let's talk about two resurrections. Resurrection to judgment, resurrection to life. The resurrection to life begins at the rapture, I believe. The resurrection is being talked about is the rising of physical bodies from the dead. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18 says, a trumpet's going to blow. When the trumpet blows, the dead in Christ will rise first. It's going to be an interesting thing. What's going to happen is if you die before the rapture, your spirit and your soul is going to go to be with God in heaven. And your body is going to go on the ground. But when that trumpet blows and the rapture happens, the resurrection of your body is going to happen. And 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58 says at that point, your mortal body will become immortal. Your perishable body that's in the ground, because your soul's in heaven, your body's in the ground, absent from the body, what? 
present with the Lord, right? So your body goes on the ground, but at that resurrection of the rapture, your body will meet your soul at the rapture if you die before the rapture. And it's going to be glorious. You're going to be, give, be given an immortal, imperishable body that's going to be like the resurrected body of Christ that is going to have all kinds of supernatural abilities. It's going to be great. I believe our bodies at that point, too, will be brought back to its strongest point, probably around the age 30 or upper 20s. And we'll be like that for the rest of eternity. It's going to be wonderful. But there's also a first resurrection that's talked about in the book of Revelation. And then Revelation chapter 20 talks about this, too. And it's in reference to the martyrs, those that are tribulation saints that come to Christ during the this, this seven years of great tribulation, and then they're martyred. At that point, their souls are going to go to heaven also. And then at the end of the great tribulation, those martyrs that have their bodies in the ground so their souls in heaven, at that point, they're going to have the resurrection also of life where they're going to be given resurrected bodies. Revelation 20 talks about that. Verse 11, it says this, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Books were open. Another book was open. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to verse 4. Reading ahead, ahead of myself again. Then I saw the thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, the martyrs, because of the testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their forehead, on their hand, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life, and the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. These, the second death, has no power, and they'll be priests of God in Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. That's the first resurrection, resurrection of life. Again, martyrs that are killed during the great tribulation, souls go to heaven, and then their bodies are, are, are reconciled with their souls at the end of the great tribulation at the first resurrection. Now, we people that are going to be, if we die before the rapture, we're going to experience that first resurrection at the rapture. Do you see that? Does it make sense? Okay, now, there's a second resurrection that's being talked about here. It's a resurrection of judgment. End of chapter 20. It says the, the dead, the spiritually dead, those that have rejected Christ, are going to be brought before a throne. It's called the great white throne of judgment. And all the books on their life are going to be open. And God's going to review everything they've done, and they're going to be judged according to their deeds. No, thank you. I don't want to be a part of that group because Jesus said very clearly on my sins and my deeds, it is finished, paid in full. But if you reject Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a resurrection that you're going to face, a resurrection of judgment. And the judgment is you're going to be brought before a great white throne and the holiness of God is going to be there. And he's going to judge you according to your deeds. And because of your rejection of Jesus Christ, you're going to be thrown in a lake of fire. Very clear, the scripture is very clear on that. Two different resurrections. The resurrection of life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your sins have been paid for. You're going to be given an immortal, imperishable body, resurrected to life at the rapture. Or if you're martyred during the Great Tribulation, at the end of the seven years of Great Tribulation. Or a resurrection of judgment. I choose life. I choose Jesus. And as we choose Jesus, what happens is we have the promise, the promise of resurrection of life. Amen? All right, let's close up our chapter now. It says this. Verse 31, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies me, and I know the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have, sent to, you have sent to John, and he is called to testify to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. For John, John the Baptist, was the lamp that was burning, was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. First testimony that Jesus points to that testifies to his greatness is his cousin, and his cousin was John the Baptist. And it's interesting because he says this John the Baptist, earlier in uh, another gospel, he said that John the Baptist was the greatest man up until his birth that had ever been born. And the reason why is because John the Baptist, all he did was point people to Jesus. His disciples came on the scene, his own disciples, he said, to, hey, don't look at me anymore, look at him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He must increase and I must what? decrease. John the Baptist testified to Jesus' greatness. Interesting, too, it says about John the Baptist there, it says that he was burning on the inside and he was shining on the outside. That's a principle for us, church. You want to you be a shining light for Jesus in the world. 
You've got to burn on the inside. And how do we burn on the inside? How do we get on fire for God on the inside? Right here, what we're doing. On the road to Emmaus, those disciples, Jesus opened the word to those disciples and said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up the word to us? Why do we spend so much time at Calvary Chapel in the Word of God? Because I want you guys to get on fire. I want you guys to burn on the inside so you could shine into a dark world. And this is our source. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And as you feed on this book, it gets you burning on the inside so you could shine on the outside. And you could be those lights that God's called you to be. Interesting, Jeremiah said, chapter 20, verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, I could not, I could not stay. Man, my goal as a pastor <laughs> is to get you guys on fire. So much on fire that the world has to come and watch you burn, man. <laughs> you know what? Because the more you get on fire the more impact you're going to make in a world that desperately needs to see the shine and light of Jesus in your worlds. And as you get in the Word, you open your heart to it, study it, meditate on it, receive it, live by it, you're going to be shining lights for Jesus Christ. And that's what John the Baptist was. Let's go on now. So first testimony was John the Baptist. Second testimony, verse 36. Ed, give me just a little bit more sound up here if you can. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So John the Baptist was a witness to Jesus, and the second witness, Jesus said, the second testifying of his greatness was his works. What did he do for those three years of public ministry? He healed the lame. He just did that in this chapter. He made the blind see. (laughs) He, uh, He raised the dead, as we already talked about, right? He uh, fed 5,000 people with two fish and, and a few loaves. He rose himself from the dead. His works testify about him. And it's interesting because these religious leaders knew their word. They knew that the Old Testament said the Messiah was going to do, make the, uh, the, the blind see and the lame walk. And now Jesus is doing these very works they knew the Messiah was supposed to do. Verse, verse 37, And the Father who sent me, he has testified on me. You have neither heard his voice or at any time seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in him who, whom he sent. Now those words stung. Those are religious leaders. These are Pharisees he's talking to. These are guys that have memorized the entire first five books, the Torah of the Old Testament. They had studied God's word, but Jesus said, you're not hearing the Father's voice. The Father's voice said, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That was at his baptism. They rejected that. Then at at his transfiguration, on the Mount of, of Transfiguration, the cloud came and the voice spoke again. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The father was very clear, testifying to the glory and the greatness of Jesus Christ. They weren't listening. And the sad thing is a lot of the world's not listening today either. Why doesn't everybody just believe in Jesus Christ and we all go to heaven together? I have a, I have a, I have a theory on that. It's not because God's not drawing them. It's because they don't want to surrender. They don't want to bow a knee to anything but themselves. Now, Frank Sinatra's song was very true for a lot of people. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. And that's why most people reject Jesus Christ. It isn't because Jesus Christ is clearly God in the flesh. It isn't because the Word of God is very clearly all of the Word of God pointing to Jesus Christ. It's because people in their stubbornness and their self-will do not want to bend a knee to Jesus Christ. But you know what I've learned? I've learned life is so much better when we're surrendered to Jesus Christ. Amen? You know, there's this bumper sticker that says, uh, God is my co-pilot. I reject that. He's my pilot. I'm, I'm just, according to Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know what that's telling me? Uh, God is the pilot. If he's driving my car, not only does he have the steering wheel, but I'm in the back trunk, dead. I, I've been crucified with Christ. I want to be dead to myself, and I want to live for Christ and let him be the one that's guiding and leading my life. And life goes so much better when that's going that way. Amen? 
Father testified, testified to Jesus' greatness. Now let's close it up. Verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If in another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from another, and you don't seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe these writings, or his writings, Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? Now, one thing I want you to see here, very interesting. It says in verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Who's that, re- who's that re- referring to? Antichrist. And it's saying, even though the religious leaders of the Jewish nation rejected Jesus Christ, and to this day, the nation of Israel as a whole has rejected Jesus Christ, there's another coming who they're going to receive. And that other one is the Antichrist that scriptures talk about. The book of Revelation is very clear. Daniel's very clear about the Antichrist. What the Antichrist is going to do is he's going to come on the scene and he's going to befriend the Jewish nation. And the way he's going to do it, it's very interesting. What he's going to do, Daniel chapter 9 says the Antichrist is going to form a peace treaty between the Jewish nation and the rest of the world, including Islam. Now, he's going to have to be one diplomat to do that. Amen? Amen. I mean, with ISIS and everything else going on in the world right now, he's coming and he's going to bring peace between these two nations of Islam and Israel. Yeah, he's going to do that. Daniel 9 tells us that. And not only that, he's going to, according to Revelation chapter 11, he's going to rebuild the temple for Israel to gain their favor. And the temple that has been extinct for 2,000 years is going to be rebuilt. And then worship is going to happen simultaneously with, I believe, the Muslims at the Dome of the Rock and then the, the Jews at their temple that's rebuilt on the Temple Mount. And there's going to be peace. There are going to be accolades from the Antichrist. And they're going to receive him as their Messiah, Now, I've been to Israel three times now, and the the gist I get from the people in Israel is they'll do anything for peace right now. They're tired of losing their sons and daughters to war. They're tired of the terrorism. And when this, this false Christ, this Antichrist comes on the scene, brings peace between them and Islam, and then rebuilds their temper, he's the Messiah to them. But then what's gonna happen midway through the Great Tribulation is he's gonna be so full of himself, the Antichrist, that he's going to set up his throne in the the Jewish temple and he's going to have the whole world worship him, the Antichrist. And at that point, it's called the abomination of desolation. At that point, the Jews' light is going to go on. The veil is going to be taken away from their heart. Romans 11, 25, 26 says, and when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then all of Israel will be saved. And I say amen to that. It's going to be fun to see the whole nation of Israel at that point reject the Antichrist and then accept Jesus Christ. It's going to be awesome. I don't know if you've ever met a Jewish person that's come to Christ, but they're evangelists. They got some, how do they say it, chutzpah? They got some passion. And they're going to be passionate Jewish evangelists during the Great Tribulation. They're going to get on fire for Christ as the veil gets taken away and they believe in Jesus Christ. But here Jesus is saying to these religious Jewish leaders right now, you've rejected me, you're going to receive the Antichrist even though he's, he's false. But he also says, interesting, you're searching the scriptures. The scriptures themselves point to me. Actually, it says in uh, Hebrews 10, verse 7, Jesus speaking, then I said, behold, I've come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. You know what that's saying? All throughout the Old Testament, constantly pointing to the greatness of Jesus Christ. We've already stated Isaiah 9, 6, right? Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government shall rest on his shoulder. Right? His, his, name, his name is four names, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And the scriptures are the last thing that testified Moses himself point to Jesus Christ. Interesting. You do a study through the Old Testament, you'll see that every single book in the Old Testament and the New Testament has some nuance that points to Jesus Christ. All throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, see it. And what I'm really excited about, I'll announce it today for the first time, 
starting in January, the first Wednesday night in January, we're going to start a whole new series on Wednesday nights. We're going to call it Route 66. And what we're going to do on Wednesday nights for 66 weeks is we're going to study every book in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and we'll do a one-week overview survey of every book in the Bible. You'll get your own manual on Wednesday nights, and you'll get a, a place for notes for Genesis, and then we'll have an outline and a survey of the whole book of Genesis in one night. And then we'll do Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and we'll go all the way for a year, a year, and a few months. And we'll, if, you, if you come on Wednesday nights, you'll study every book in the Bible and have a firm grasp on what every book in the Bible has to say uh, in regards to the outline, the structure. I mean, how many of you right now, what does is, what is the uh, overview or what does Habakkuk have to say to us? Anyone, anyone raise their hand and offer, offer a review on that one? By the time we're done with this series, you'll understand. And the thing we're going to end every Bible study on Wednesday night with, too, is we're going to talk about the nuance of that book that points to Jesus Christ. Because every book in the Bible eventually points to Jesus Christ. There's a scarlet thread that runs through every book in the Bible. Amen? So what do we see about the greatness of Jesus Christ this morning? Three things we saw that Jesus said make him great. He's equal with who? God. He's working to do what? The Father's will. He's the source of eternal life. Four things that testify to the greatness of Jesus. John the Baptist, his works or his miracles, the Heavenly Father in his voice, and then lastly, the last thing that testifies to Jesus Christ's greatness is what? The Scriptures. Amen? Can we say Jesus is great? Come on, church. Jesus is great. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for a, a Sunday before Thanksgiving we could study the greatness of Jesus. We thank you so much, God, that you sent your best when you sent Jesus to this world. And unto us a son was given, unto us a child was born, unto, uh, and on his shoulders rested the very government of this world. We thank you for that, God. And as we read at the beginning of this message, that one sol solitary life has changed this world and has changed us. More importantly, Jesus has changed us. And so, Father, would you help us to be a people that are in love with Jesus and are beholding his face as we talked about last week so you could change us to be more and more like him. Father, I thank you, God, that your word, your word is the source for us to be on fire on the inside so we could burn on the outside, God. And so, Lord, help us to be people that are, love your word, not only love Jesus, but love your word, God, because this is our food. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from our mouth, God, or your mouth, God. We thank you, God, that your word uh, is what helps us to grow in respect to our salvation, God. We thank you that your word is our spiritual food, too, Father. Thank you for that, God. And I pray, too, for anybody that might be here that feels like they're stuck, maybe spiritually, and need to start going forward again spiritually. Lord, help us as your people to recommit to just spending time with Jesus and experience his greatness in our lives, God. Thank you, Father, so much that as we just behold his face as we talked about last week, that we see the greatness of Jesus. We experience the greatness of Jesus. And we're changed by the greatness of Jesus. Thank you, Father, too, that as we seek your will, God, as we say along with Jesus, not my will be done, but your will be done, that's when blessing comes. As we trust in you with all our heart, and lean not on our own understanding, but always acknowledge you, God. You can make our path straight. And Father, I pray for us too as a church this morning that we would be on bended knee. We would be a group of people that just say, more of you, Jesus, less of me. You must increase, I must decrease. And Father, we want to do your will in this world. We want to go your way. And so, Father, I pray for people that might be here that are coming up on decisions, Lord. I pray that you might give them your will. I pray that they would just yield to whatever leading that you're leading them in, God, and understand that your will is good, and it's, it's acceptable, it's perfect. Help us to once again put ourselves on that altar, Lord, that we say we want to be those living sacrifices acceptable to you, which is our spiritual service of worship, God. Help us to be a people that are just stay in that position of surrender so you can bless our lives, God. And Father, I know that as we delight ourselves in you, Father, you're going to give us the desires of our heart. You're going to make our lives count. You're going to make our lives meaningful and purposeful and lives that are shining lights for you, God. And so even this Thanksgiving week, Lord, 
with all the activities, all the family get-togethers, all the eating. Help us to be just those shining lights for you, God, with family members, with friends. Help us to be bringing the light of Jesus into the homes and the meals and the people we're with, God. Use us for your glory, God. Let us be those shining lights even this week in places where there might be some darkness, God. Thank you for church, Lord. Thank you for an opportunity to get recalibrated and spiritually uh, fed, God. And help us to continue just to commit to being in this place so we can behold your face, God. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's stand, church.